My name's Ian Robinson. Um, I'm a developer at Neo Technology. And Neo are the commercial sponsors for Neo4j, which is an open source JVM-based graph database. So I'm going to be talking today about graphs and graph technology, graph database technology, and the way in which they can be used to solve some really interesting, uh, interesting data problems, data challenges. So I'm going to start by reflecting a little on the rise of graph and graph technologies over the last few years. Then I'll briefly discuss the graph database I'm most familiar with, which is Neo4j. That's the thing that I work on day to day. Um, I'll describe its data model. And then I've actually got some working examples, different applications where we're doing things like recommendations, fraud analysis, uh, route planning. So some, some examples to show you how some of this works. Okay. So I think it's a really interesting time to be a developer, yeah, probably more so than at any other time in the last 10 years. Um, and that's partly because there are some really interesting technologies um, and architectures out there for us to, to use and to play with. But for me, it's also the fact that we're using software in more interesting ways today. We're applying it in ways that generate some really interesting and useful end user value. So if you think of what we were doing about 20 years ago as an industry, we were creating calculation engines, effectively. You know, pieces of software that would calculate payroll or calculate sales tax or manage your inventory. You know, stuff that just, where, where there's a right or a wrong answer. You know, there's a right answer when you're calculating tax, and there's a wrong answer. If it's a wrong answer, you've got a bug. Okay? So we're developing on this kind of stuff, um, calculation-based, and it's very much within the confines of the business. Yeah, it's software that's being used, lines, line of business applications that are being used inside the business. You think how things have changed over that, those last 20 years, and in particular over the last 10 years. There's probably not a day goes by when each of us doesn't use a lot of software as part of our lives, not just our working lives, but you know, our home lives, our social lives, and so on. You know, so software today is deeply embedded in the social and cultural and economic fabric of our lives. And it's doing quite different things. It's not just about applying strict calculations. You know, we use it for connectiveness, to connect to one another. But it also has this kind of suggestive and inferential characteristic to it as well. You know, even just simple recommendations engines. They're not calculating a strict result. They're suggesting to you, these are some things that you might be interested in in the future, based on what we understand about you today. Okay. So companies are discovering there's a lot of value to be made from being imprecise, from being suggestive, rather than strictly applying a calculation and saying, this is the right answer, and there are all the wrong answers. So that, that, to me, is a fundamental shift in the way in which software impacts our lives and the way in which it's embedded in our lives. And it's no longer taking place within the confines of the business, within the enterprise. It's there in everything that we do in, in many of the devices that we use day to day. Okay. So I work in a corner of the software industry that, in the past, has been a very, very niche area, graphs, and graph databases. I mean, again, five years ago, if you heard of graphs, it was probably within the boundaries of the university. It was just an academic topic. You may have studied it as a data structure and algorithms in computer science. Um, and then there's lots of other kind of graph-based research around social networking and stuff like that. But again, all of that confined to the university. But actually, a lot of that software that we use day to day that has a real impact on our lives is driven in some form or another by graph. All of the really big web properties today Google and Facebook and Twitter depend upon graph for graph search, Facebook's graph search, Google's knowledge graph, um, you know, the, the Twitter, the social graph. All of these things have an impact on our lives today. Okay. So graph has come out of the, the academic realm, and it may not be frontmost in, in all of your interactions with that software or the ways in which you conduct yourselves, but it's there. It has a strong but hidden influence over all of the things that you're doing today. So what is it about graphs and graph technology that mean that they've become such a, a, a dominant, albeit hidden force, in a lot of the things that we do today? Well, for me, 
it's at the highest level, you know, in the most abstract level. When I, when I survey a lot of the things that I've done over the last few years where we've been using graph databases, it's about managing complexity yeah, and complex data. The data that we have today, or rather the ways in which we use that data, is more complex than ever before. And for me, that complexity is a function of at least three things. It's a function of increased data size, uh, an increase in variable structure, and an increase in connectedness. And when these three forces come together, we're dealing with extremely or particularly complex data. Large volumes of variably structured, densely connected data. This is complex data. And the kinds of questions that we ask of it require us to manage this variable structure and require us to understand something about this connectedness. So we all probably know about uh, increased data size, about big data. You know, we're generating more data than ever before. Uh, the volume of net new data that we're generating year on year is growing exponentially. Um, and that's, that's a trend that's just going to continue for the foreseeable future. You know, we're generating data with every device that we use. We're interacting with business partners. We're consuming data um, over the web. You know, every application that we build is generating large volumes of logging data, and all of that's important to us today. You know, every path through our website that a customer takes, again, generating this enormous volume of data. So that's one of the forces that we're having to contend with today. And that's one of the forces that's given rise to that larger family of NoSQL databases, you know, having to deal with in enormous volumes of data and manage it, take account of it, and query it. But then there are these two other forces, variable structure and connectedness. Now, variable structure is something that's been with us for a long time. Variable structure is that kind of messy, real-world data that doesn't always fit into a one-size-fits-all relational schema. And for me, variable structure is actually a function partly of increased data size. You know, the more that we learn about the things that we're interested in, the more we learn about the things in our domain that we're interested in, the more each of those things begins to look subtly different from every other. And so at a very high level, all of our customers look the same. They've probably got a first name and a last name and so on. But the more we, we find out about them, the more they tell us about themselves or the more we discover about them, the more each of those customers or those users begins to look subtly different from every other. Lots of different attributes. Some of them shared, some of them unique to particular individuals. And we want to try and capture all of that and, and take advantage of it. How can we do that? Well, in the past, um, if we're using relational technology, we might apply all the normal forms and we end up with you know, several tables that we would join to our central user table in order to accommodate all of those different attributes. You know, consider, for an example, all the different ways that you could identify me on the web. I've got a Twitter handle. You can contact me on Skype. I've got a couple of email addresses. There's some of the attributes that are particular to me. Some of you may share some of those identity pieces of information. You know, you've got your own email addresses, your own Twitter handle. But you might have other things that identify you on the web as well. Facebook account, LinkedIn account, and so on. If we were going to accommodate all of that variation in, in relational, we'd probably pull it out as a separate contact table and then join it to our user table, which is great. We can, we, we can accommodate all of that variable structure in the relational database. But then at the point where we go into production, you know, we just want to discover some simple information about a user, we have to join. Perhaps we have to join and join and join again in order to bring all of that information together and present it on the screen or present it elsewhere within our application. And there's a performance penalty to doing that. If you've got an enormous customer base and you're joining over and over again, a lot of your queries are really going to slow down. They're going to deteriorate. So what we do in the relational world to accommodate all of this variable structure is we denormalize. And we create these very broad, sparse tables. Tables with lots of nullable columns. All those columns represent the superset of all the possible attributes that, uh, that we know about with regard to our entire customer base. And then for any particular row in that table, we'll fill out the columns that are relevant to that particular user, and we'll null out all the others. So to deal with variable structure, we have sparse tables with nullable columns, lots of null values, and then in the application, we have to have lots of null checking logic. Yeah. So that's variable structure. And then the third thing here is connectedness. Yeah. A lot of the really interesting questions that we want to ask of our data today require us to understand how the things in our domain are connected. 
we need to understand that two things are connected, either directly or by way of some intermediaries. And more than that, we, we need to know not only that two things are connected, very often we need to know something about the strength or the weight or the quality of those connections. We need to, answer, to ask and answer some really interesting questions, we need to know that things are connected, and we need to know something about the strength or the weight or the quality of those connections. So, I mean, these examples from, from different domains that I've worked in over the last few years where we've had to manage large volumes of variably structured and densely connected data and where the questions that we're asking of that data require us to manage that structure and to understand elements of that connectedness. So, social networking is the obvious poster child here where you've got lots and lots of different people within that network. They're connected in different ways. You know, we may, we may be uh, connected by way of work we may have a strong friendship that goes all the way back to childhood. Different ways in which we're connected. We need to understand the semantics of those connections, and we need to know something about the strength of those connections as well, the quality of those connections. And then we can discover not only that your friends, but the friends of your friends and so on. And this is the area that is probably uh, the most well-known with regard to graph. I mean, Facebook has popularized that notion of, of social graph. But it's also the area that is uh, probably best understood within academia as well. Tens of years of research into smaller communities, social networks, and some of the behaviors that are transmitted within those social networks. The way in which things like the propensity for obesity or the propensity for smoking can actually be transmitted at depth two or three within a network. That you can actually be influenced by people you don't even know, by the friends of the friends of your friends. So that's one area in which you know, these, these technologies are being applied today. Others are things like network impact analysis, modeling the entirety of a telecommunications network from the customers and the applications and the services, the machines, the virtual machines, the data centers, all the way down to some of the lower level network elements, the fibers, the routers, the switches, modeling all of that and then being able to do rapid impact analysis against that network structure being able to say, well, given this important customer of mine, which parts of the network do they actually depend upon? Which machines, well, which applications, machines, which lower level network elements do they depend, depend upon? Do we have redundancy throughout the network on behalf of these customers? And if we don't, what can we do to introduce it or to mitigate against the, the network failing uh, on, on their behalf? That's kind of top-down analysis. You can do bottom-up analysis as well. Given this low level network element, this router or this switch, who's it going to impact if it fails or if we have to replace or repair it? And if we're pl planning a replacement or a repair program where we want to replace multiple pieces of hardware at the same time, perhaps over the course of a weekend, are we going to maintain redundancy on behalf of some of those, those customers or are we actually going to break the network on their behalf? Okay. So these are, again, some of the kinds of questions that you can ask of a, of a, a variably structured, densely connected uh, data structure. I won't go through all of them in, in too much detail. In fact, a couple of them we're going to pick up in the examples later. Uh, the other things here that I will mention briefly, root finding. You know, this goes all the way back to the foundations of, of graph theory, several hundred years of graph theory, much of it about root finding, about finding the shortest path through a network, being able to apply shortest weighted path traversals across the network, given a couple of stations on the London Underground, for example, what's the, the most efficient route to get from one to the other? And in order to be, to be able to answer that question, we need to know how the stations are connected within the network, but we also need to know something about the quality of those connections. How many trains are there per hour or per minute? How long, on average, does it take to get from this station to that? And then given those properties, we can very easily calculate the, the, the shortest weighted path and determine what's the most efficient or effective route through the network. Okay. So for me, graphs are great at managing that kind of complexity. Large-ish volumes of variably structured and densely connected data where we need to accommodate all of that variable structure and we need to understand something about the connections and the paths through the system in order to be able to answer the questions that we, we need to. So I work with Neo4j. Neo4j is a database. It's a JVM-based graph database that allows us to, to model and store and query our data in the form of a graph. 
So we'll model our domain as a graph, we will store it as a graph, and then we will query it, query it as a graph. And when we're querying it, we're, look, we're either looking for existing graph structures, we're saying, find me this graph or this subgraph structure within the existing data set, or we're creating new graph structures. We're saying, I want you to create this graph or this subgraph structure within the data set. So it's graphs from top to bottom, model, store, and query your data in the form of a graph. And we employ a very particular graph data model in Neo4j. It's kind of a very pragmatic approach to modeling graphs. And it just comprises four fundamental parts, four primitives, really, in our data model that you might then use where if you're building your own application and you're building your own application graph data model, you'll apply these primitives in order to develop that data model. So those four primitives are nodes, relationships, properties, and labels. Okay. And I've got an example of our data model of what we call the labeled property graph here. You know, very, very small graph. I mean, it's only six nodes and so on. Um, whereas we can actually accommodate billions upon billions of nodes and relationships. But what we're showing here are a couple of authors, a couple of the books that they've written, and a couple of people who've bought and likely read those books. Okay. So the first thing we have are the nodes, these, these blue ovals. Now we tend to use nodes to represent the things in our domain that we're interested in, entities, anything that has identity. Okay. So we're using nodes to represent things in our domain. And a node is effectively a container for a set of properties, for a set of key value pairs. So we use the properties, we can attach properties to a node to represent the attributes of the things that we're interested in. So you can see that for John Le Carre, I've attached a name and a date of birth property. For Graham Greene, we've got name, date of birth, and the date when, when Graham Greene died. So if we know more about one entity than we do about another, we just attach another property. No two nodes need share exactly the same set of properties. So already at the level of the individual nodes, the individual entities, we're already accommodating a degree of variable structure. Yeah. So at that point, we've got this very simple record-like structure, little islands of data. But then we can introduce more structure by connecting those nodes with relationships. And every relationship in Neo4j has a name and a direction. And that serves two functions, really. Uh, the first thing is, well, it helps structure the overall data set. Um, and again, it accommodates variable structure. No two nodes need be connected in exactly the same way. But then the name and the direction also uh, lends semantic context to each of the nodes. Okay. So we understand what each node means partly as a function of the way in which it's connected to all of its peers, to all of its surrounding nodes. So we can see that John Le Carre wrote The Tailor of Panama, and Graham Greene wrote Our Man in Havana. So the name and the direction are first-class elements within the data model. And as a developer or as a data architect, you're responsible for deciding the direction and deciding upon the name. And you don't have to, to come up with a, a list of possible names up front. You don't have to come up with some strict, rigid schema before you start modeling your data or actually introducing data into the database. You can just introduce names as and when you see fit. If you discover new kinds of relationships between the things that you're interested in, create a new relationship and give it a new name. Okay. So that's nodes, relationships, and properties. And in fact, we've talked about attaching properties to nodes to capture entity attributes. We can also attach properties to relationships. And so to all of the purchase relationships here, I've attached a timestamp property. Now, whereas we attach properties to nodes to represent entity attributes, we tend to attach properties to relationships to represent the strength or the weight or the quality of that relationship. Okay. So again, if we were modeling a transport network, we'd perhaps use properties on particular relationships to represent the number of trains per hour or the average time it takes to get between these two nodes, these two uh, physical locations. And then we can take advantage of those property values as we're traversing the graph, as we're calculating the route through the graph. And then the fourth element here are these labels. So you can see that every node in my example here has one or more labels. Labels are effectively a way of tagging each node. And we use labels to help represent the role that a node plays within our data set. We can see that this node here, bottom left, represents both a person and more specifically an author. Okay. And the labels give, a very, give us a very simple grouping semantic. I can say to the database, find me all of the nodes labeled book. 
I just want to get all of the nodes that are labeled book. It's effectively all the nodes that represent books in my system. But I can also use the labels to associate a couple of different behaviors at the level of the, the database. I can associate indexes with labels. I can say, look, every node that's labeled book, I want you to index it based on its ISBN property. So then I can, I can kind of parachute into the data set and recover a node with a specific ISBN property value. So we can associate indexes with labels, and then any nodes bearing those labels will be indexed. We can also associate unique constraints with labels. So I can say, look, every node that's labeled book, I want you to ensure its ISBN property is unique within the context of this data set. So labels is something that we introduced quite recently. I mean, Neo4j itself has been around for 10, 12 years, actually. You know, it's actually quite a, an old piece of technology. But labels is something very new within our data model. We're effectively making it easier for you to represent the role that something plays, and we're making it easier to associate optional constraints, to layer optional constraints on top of the data model. So today, those constraints are things like unique constraints. In the future, they'll be slightly more sophisticated. I've got a question yeah. So the question is, can we index the properties on relationships? And the answer is yes. Not as easily as we can index the stuff on the nodes, but we can index relationship properties. Um, we're currently in this kind of hybrid situation where we have uh, a slightly older indexing implementation that still allows you to index the properties on the relationships. That, that functionality hasn't made it through into the, the kind of stuff that I'm talking about with regard to labels. But fundamentally, yes, you can index relationship properties, and you can look up all of the, the purchased relationships where the property value is between these two values, for example. Yep. Yeah, so, so there's a question there. I could also do purchased as a separate node. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the techniques for, for modeling your data, I mean, my, my base advice is you kind of derive your data model from the kinds of questions that you want to ask of it. You design for queryability. Um, and if there's a lot more about each individual purchase that you need to know, you know, if it becomes the locus for a whole, for a large number of different uh, dimensions, if you need to know when that purchase took place, where it took place, who made it, and so on, then you would likely turn that into a node in and of itself. Yeah, and then you can connect an arbitrary number of dimensions to it. This is a very, very simple data model. We could very easily evolve it to introduce nodes that represent purchases, and then again, we could index those. So what I'm going to do, I mean, that's you know, the, the highest, quickest introduction I could give you to, to Neo4j or more specifically to the data model that we employ. You know, as I say, it's a JVM-based graph database. Um, runs predominantly today as a server product. So you install it as a server product. You can cluster it for high availability, high read throughput. Um, and you can, clients on any platform can connect to it over HTTP. We effectively exchange JSON formatted documents with the server over HTTP and that allows you to create and query data inside the database. What I'm going to show now are some specific applications of that technology, the ways in which people are, are using it today in order to do some of this more interest, this interesting inferential predictive stuff. And then we'll look at, towards the end, some things that are based more around calculations, but actually based around interesting kinds of calculations, root-based calculations and stuff like that. So the first thing here is yeah. making connections. So I'm going to start by discussing, it's probably one of the simplest concepts in graph theory, um, but it's also one of the most powerful. And it's something that's actually applicable in lots and lots of different domains. And it's something called triadic closure. So what's triadic closure? Okay. Well, what we observe is that uh, in a lot of different kinds of networks, but particularly those networks where there's some kind of human agency, things like social networks, we observe in those networks, at a very local level, specific elements in the network try to form stable, closed triangles. If you observe the evolution of the network over time, you'll notice that at this very, very local level, individual elements within the network will try and form these stable, balanced triangles. Hence the term triadic closure. Okay. Now I'll try and make this a bit more concrete. We've got a very, very simple social network here, tiny little social network. Terry, Bill, and Sarah. 
So we can see that Terry and Sarah have a friend in common, Bill. They don't currently know one another, or as far as we're aware, they don't know one another. But because of this mutual friend, there's a, a higher chance than normal that at some point in the future, Terry and Sarah will meet one another or become aware of one another and may in fact become friends. Okay. So there's a greater than normal chance that at some point in the future, we will close this triangle, that Terry and Sarah will become friends because they have both the means and the opportunity. Yep. They, they, because they both know Bill, there may be occasions where they're both with Bill and therefore they get to meet one another. Um, and because they're both friends with Bill and they, they most likely trust Bill, they probably also trust the people that Bill trusts. So they've got the means and the opportunity to meet one another, or the means and the motive. Yeah? So that's triadic closure. So we can actually take, you know, this is, this is a, a very commonly observed behavior within networks, in particular social networks, and other kinds of networks where there's some kind of human agency. We can take this, this, this behavior and effectively use it as a very simple predictive tool. Okay? Here's Terry. Terry's got a friend, Bill. And as we've seen, Bill has this other friend, Sarah. Well, instead of waiting for these two people, perhaps, to, to meet one another or become aware of one another or establish that friendship, why don't we suggest that they get to know one another? Why don't we recommend that Terry meet Sarah, Sarah meet Terry? Okay? You see this all the time. You probably see it on Facebook. You see it on Twitter. These are the people you might want to connect with. Yeah? You see it as part of recommendations engines. People who purchase these kind of things also purchase that. The people who purchase the things that you've purchased have also been buying this kind of stuff. Okay? We're identifying opportunities for closing the triangle. So, let's have a look at a tiny little social network. Okay, so I've got a version of Neo4j running here, a server version of Neo4j. And when you run Neo4j as a server, you get this nice little uh, web-based admin tool. It's effectively a REPL. It allows me to write queries, and it allows me to view the results of those queries. So, let's look at the overall network that I've created. And I'll talk through, you know, we've got this query language. I'll talk through a little bit of that in a moment, although I'm not going to go into it in any great depth. But you can see, is it okay from the back? I know it's a bit blurred, a bit pixelated. But you can see I've got a social network here. I don't know quite how many people I've got, 10, 15 or so, you know, and a number of different friendships. Let's find Terry, just Terry. There we are. Thank you. You can see that Terry's got some immediate friends. And then each of those friends has a number of friends as well. Some of whom already know Terry, and some of whom don't. Okay. What we can do, we can, okay, Terry's our current logged on user. He's the person we're currently dealing with. Let's try and identify all of the friends of Terry's friends that Terry doesn't currently know. And let's count the number of opportunities to close those triangles and rank them. And then where, you know, there are several of Terry's mutual friends who are all pointing, um, you know, at a third party, we'll, we'll kind of rank them and we'll make a recommendation based on the, the highest likelihood of closing that triangle. Okay. So the query, I'm going to talk through this query in a bit more detail in a moment when we go back to the slides. But effectively, we've got this very simple query here. It's a tiny query. Yeah. This is our query language. Um, and it's allowing us to traverse or navigate that network and to match specific graph patterns within that network. Um, but this is effectively saying, find me all of the friends of Terry's friends, um, but in particular, look for ones where Terry isn't currently connected to that other, that other person, that third party. And let's rank them and, uh, and select the ones that appear towards the top of the list. And if I run that, we can see that within that network, Terry... Uh, there's probably a strong chance that at some point in the future, Terry's going to meet Henry, and then a pretty good chance he's going to meet Emily and Colin, and so on. So effectively, we can use this as the basis of a recommendation. These are people that you might like to connect with. So I'm going to talk through that query in just a bit more detail. Okay, so this is what we were looking at a moment ago. This is uh, Neo4j's query language. It's a query language called Cypher. 
and cipher. It's kind of like SQL for graphs. It's a multi-clause declarative language. But instead of doing set-based operation on tabular data, this is allowing us to match graph patterns inside of a, a network structure. And at the heart of Cypher is the idea that we can describe to the database the kind of network structure, the kind of graph or subgraph structure that we would either like to create or to discover within the data set. In fact, we want to be able to draw on behalf of the database the kind of graph structure that we'd like to find or create. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So this first clause here, match, this is where we're describing to the database, this is the kind of structure I would like to find, okay? Um, and the syntax that we're using here is a kind of pictographic representation of a graph. So we're using parentheses to represent nodes, okay? So we've got a node here that represents Terry, and another node here that represents all of, well, actually, it represents the, the, the friends of Terry's friends, but, you know, this thing here represents some other nodes out there on the network. In between, we use dashes, and very often we'll use greater than and less than signs, but we use dashes to represent the relationships. And we put the relationship name between these square brackets. So we're creating a kind of little, very simple pictographic representation of a, of a little subgraph structure that we want to discover inside the data set. Um, and this part here is saying, look, we want to find any node that is labeled user that has a name property whose value is Terry. Now, actually, in a large data set, there may be very many, there may be lots and lots of Terry's. So, actually, we'd probably be using a property value that is more unique, perhaps Terry's email address or their, you know, some other unique identifier. This is just my simple toy data set. But if we found multiple people who match this thing, they'd all get bound to this little variable here, this, this, uh, this identifier. Anyway, we're saying, find me the node that represents Terry. And then I want you to match all of the, the, the friend relationships that connect Terry immediately to his friends. And then I want you to go to depth two. I actually want you to, to, to match against the friends of Terry's friends. So this is what we call a variable length relationship. Match, well, actually it's not variable length. It's strictly defined. It's saying match uh, outgoing friend relationships. And then whatever you find at the end of that, match further friend relationships beyond. And whatever we discover at depth two, we're going to call other. Yep. Does that make sense? Okay. So effectively, we're describing this little pattern. This thing here is a way of drawing this picture. There's a node that represents Terry, which we're going to, to use a variable for the, the purposes of the query. We're going to call it the user. We're looking for friend relationships. We're not so interested in Terry's immediate friends. We're interested in the friends of his friends, these others. And then this where clause is saying, yep, yeah, we're interested in all of the friends of Terry's friends, but only so long as there isn't an existing connection between Terry and that friend of a friend. So we're saying where this kind of relationship doesn't currently exist. So we're definitely looking for those opportunities to connect the triangle. The triangle doesn't currently exist, but you know, here's the opportunity to do so. Okay? So this is the structure we're looking for. These things have to exist, that one And then in the return clause, we're firstly, we're, we're counting all of the people that we match. As I say, Terry's got a number of friends, and all of those friends have a number of friends. And it may be that two or three of Terry's friends all know the same person that Terry doesn't. So that other person will crop up two or three times in our result set. So we're counting the number of times each individual occurs in the result set, and we're aliasing that as their score. And then we're just creating a projection of the the overall results on behalf of the client, and we're ordering it by the score, highest score first. So that's exactly what we saw in the results a moment ago. Yep. So, uh, Terry is not returned because those identifiers, those little, you know, I, I had user and other as temporary variables within my, within my query. That has the it's kind of implicit side effect of saying that these two nodes are different. If I'd used exactly the same uh, name, then we could effectively match against circular dependencies. Yeah, so Terry doesn't crop up at this point in those results. Um, but also, I mean, interestingly, if we're looking for the friends of Terry's friends, well, we first of all have to go by way of a, a friendship that already exists. 
So there's, yeah, I, I, I kind of see the point, but we're, we're definitely excluding the fact that that friendship already exists. So that's another reason why Terry doesn't appear in the results. Now, actually, if we go back to the, um, the graph itself and just briefly look at these friendships. As I said, one of the interesting things about graphs is, you know, they, they allow us to model connectedness. Um, and in that Neo4j data model, we can give a name and a direction to each relationship. But we can also attach properties to represent the strength or the weight or the quality of that relationship. And actually here, based on some information that people have given us, we've been able to, to quantify or qualify each of those relationships. We've been able to attach a strength to each relationship. So we can actually take account of that as well in our, in our queries. So I've got a slightly more complex query, which I'm not going to discuss in so much detail, but it's very, very similar. We're still looking uh, for friends, you know, depth to, friend of a friend. But now we're taking account, you can see it here, in our where clause, we're taking account of the strength of that friendship, and we're only looking for strong friendships, friendships that are valued two or above. And that gives us a slightly different set of results. We still get Henry at the top, but actually Colin and Chloe appeared further down in our initial set of results. But it may be there's a greater chance that, that these people will, will meet first, will meet Terry first, because of the strength of those friendships. Yep. And we can actually combine all of these calculations in order to, you know, to, to come up with some of these very simple, predictive, suggestive capabilities. So that's kind of simple pattern matching within the graph. But it's applying a well-understood principle of, of networks, this thing about triadic closure. And triadic closure, as I say, is, is relatively domain agnostic. It doesn't have to be about very simple social networks like this. It can apply more generally, particularly where we have human agency. Now, I, always, I kind of always run a risk when I introduce this as the first example. Um, you know, my colleagues say, well, look, you always talk about social networks. People come away with the idea that graph databases are just good for social networks. And my answer is, well, actually, there's a lot of social stuff out there. And it's not just the trite social stuff around Facebook or Yo or stuff like that. You know, for years, businesses have been bracketing off the human element and just trying to focus on the facts. But actually, human behaviors have a lot of influence over... You know, many, many areas of our lives. Language is social. Economics is social. Software development is social. That's why conferences like this always have an agile track, because agile recognizes that so software development is a social activity. That's, all, that's why there's always that kind of palliative care tutorial or set of talks that make you feel better about the fact that your organization is fucked up. You know, the bugs are in the people and not in the software. So social extends far more broadly than Facebook and Yo. Yep. And so I think, you know, reintroducing social, and this is what the large web properties, these are, these are the ways in which people are generating value today. They're acknowledging the social element in lots and lots of different things that we do. And so these kind of principles can apply very, very broadly. All right, so we were pattern matching there. We can actually come up with slightly more sophisticated patterns, again, in order to do some kind of predictive analysis. Um, we have a, a friend, actually, somebody who works out here in the Netherlands, who's doing a lot of stuff with, with graphs, who says, you know, in a graph, there's nowhere to hide. You can hide lots of behaviors in a tabular st structure. But when you're looking at a graph, the, the human eye very quickly takes account of the patterns. There's nowhere to hide in a graph. So it's very easy to discover patterns that are otherwise hidden when you're looking at some other data structure. So graphs today are being used for things like fraud analysis. An example here is uh, what we call first party fraud. First party fraud is a situation where you've got a number of different people, fraudsters, who uh, together constitute a fraud ring. And this group of people will create a bucket of identity information. Identity information such as social security numbers, phone numbers, addresses, and so on. And then each of the members of that ring will pick and choose bits of identity information from that bucket and use them to create 
or, or to extend lines of credit. They use them to create accounts and so on. Okay. So you're kind of picking bits of identity information from the bucket. Um, and very often when you're opening an account, you have to supply several different bits of identity information. Each application probably doesn't use exactly the same set of information as all the other applications. So there's this kind of broad spread with some overlap between the different bits of identity information. And then your fraudsters, they behave like good citizens for a while. They open an account, have a line of credit, they borrow against it, they pay back, they look, everything looks fine and dandy. And then at some point, whether it's some months or some years down the line, altogether, they just disappear off the radar. They kind of clear out the accounts, and all the money's gone. Okay. Now, the only way in which you can identify this, and identify it in a timely manner, or identify your likely risk or exposure, is to understand all the connections between all the different things in this network. The people, and the accounts, and all those different bits of identity information. And then at the point in time where somebody's applying for an account, you can assess the likelihood that they're participating in a fraud ring. What you're effectively looking for within that network structure are broad flowering connections. Yep, kind of broad, widespread of connections. So if you've got a, a family all living at the same address, perhaps several members of that family, the parents, perhaps you know, some of the eldest children, they may all open accounts and they'll all use the same address. That's all fine. When you're analyzing the network, you'd expect to see these little clusters of shared information. But if those clusters broaden, if they kind of flower and extend outwards, and you're dealing with many, many people and many different bits of identity information, all subtly linked and interlinked in this way, then there's a greater chance that you're dealing with a fraud ring. So we've got a fraud ring here. You know, three people from our previous social network. We've got Bill and Colin and Lucy. And each of them has opened two or three different lines of credit, loans and credit cards and bank accounts. And then in blue, we can see all those different pieces of identity information, the addresses and the social security numbers, the telephone numbers, and so on. And you can see that each person has used a slightly different combination, but that each piece of identity information is actually being shared by at least two people. You know, this is that kind of broader spread. So again, we've got the same thing here. Slightly turned on its side, but again, you can see the nodes that represent Lucy and Bill and Colin, all the identity information, um, and all the accounts that they currently hold. Now, I'm not going to talk through the query again in too much detail, but I've got a query here. I wonder, though, whether I should... There's a bit more to it. It's just... This is the query. We're doing quite a bit more in this query. Uh, this is somebody, this is a new person coming along. Who is it? Uh, I can't see it at this point in time. Perhaps it's further off the screen. But we've got a new applicant. Somebody, yep, here it is. Terry. It's Terry again. Bloody Terry. All the time. So Terry is applying for an account. Um, and he's using some existing identity information. He's also supplying some new bits of identity information as well. So at the point in time where Terry's applying for the account and we're trying to create, register him with the system, that's what we're doing in the first half. We're kind of creating new data. Well, we're trying to create new data and we're trying to reuse existing bits of data. So if some of this identity information already exists, then we'll reuse it. If it's new, then we'll create new nodes to represent that new information. So we do all of that in the first half and then in the second half of the query, we then take all of the identity information that Terry supplied and we kind of traverse outwards. We crawl the graph and look for the ways in which that identity information is being used in different contexts. And we're using that to form a judgment. Again, to predict, to be suggestive and inferential. Is this perhaps part of a fraud ring? Is this one of these broad spreads? So it's difficult to see the query when the, the monitor is this size, hence using TextMate. But if I run that, Again, we've supplied all the information, and now we can see that for things like the national insurance number, there are at least three different people who are all using that national insurance number. Similarly, for this phone number, we've got three people. And there's a bit of overlap here. We're beginning to identify all of the different members of that ring and the, the bits of information that are being used. Okay. So this is something that we could do 
at the point in time where somebody is actually applying for an account. It's not after the fact analysis, it's not batch processing analysis, it's point in time analysis when somebody is actually submitting details perhaps over the web or over the phone. Okay. And again, you know, we've got a tiny little data set here, but obviously if you're dealing with a, a large financial network, you're dealing with millions upon millions of these nodes and connections. But again, you can still get lively results, and millisecond results, even when you're querying against that larger structure. Because the nice thing about a graph query is, once you've parachuted into the graph with your starting points, Terry and his identity information, all you're interested in doing is exploring as much of the graph as is necessary to answer the particular question at hand. You don't need to explore the entire graph, you're just looking for the connections. So you're just carving out a smaller portion of the graph. This is very different from computing a join in the relational world, where you have to compute the Cartesian product of all the possible things that you're matching, and then throw most of it away. You know, we can get millisecond performance where the, the, the equivalent joins in the relational world might take minutes. Okay, just got a few minutes left. Yeah. So one final example. So both of these have been about pattern matching and they've been very much about that kind of predictive and suggestive and inferential capability that I mentioned at the beginning. You know, our lives have changed over the last 10 years, and the way in which software is impacting us is not just about strict calculation, it's also um, being predictive and suggestive and inferential. But actually, there's still, uh, there's still a place in the software world for doing calculations, for doing something where you can either be right or you can be wrong. It doesn't matter how screwed your organization is and how many agile tracks you end up attending. Um, so what we've got here is an example of uh, root finding in a parcel network. So Neo4j today is being used in the largest parcel network in Europe to calculate uh, the routes through the network. A parcel enters the network, and at that point in time, we have to calculate the most effective route to the ultimate destination. And we have to do that very, very quickly. Because the parcel, as it enters the network, is actually going down a chute. It takes less than a second to go down the chute, and at the bottom of the chute, it's going to get switched one way or the other. And we have to calculate the most effective route through the network before it gets to the bottom of the chute. And there are, you know, at peak times, there are 2,000, 3,000 parcels per second entering the network. You know, 3,000 or so at Christmas time. All right? And you're dealing with quite a large network. You've got 25 national parcel centers. 2 million postcodes, 30 million individual addresses. So it's a very large network. Okay. So variably structured, densely connected, and reasonably large bodies of data. And we've got these strict time requirements. And the other thing is, the graph, the network changes over time. You know, there are more trucks on the road at Christmas time than there are during the summer. So we have to be very sensitive as to the, the structure of the network at any particular moment. And looking forwards a couple of days, we need to anticipate what the structure of the network is going to be at that point in time. So this is effectively the, the data model that we have. And if, you've, you know, if, you, if you picked up the book from the booth, you know, we talk about this example in a lot more detail in, in the book. But effectively, you've got national parcel centers and delivery bases, delivery areas, going down to these delivery segments. And there are, there are particular routes that connect all of these elements. Um, and for any particular point in time, there's always one good route between a delivery segment and a delivery area, and between a delivery area and a delivery base. But, as I say, over time, because more trucks on the road at Christmas, these routes change. So our overall data model is this. You know, this is far more variably structured and densely connected. And then for any particular pair of nodes, we're kind of attributing those nodes. We're saying, well, this is the, you know, the logical cost of traversing this relationship for this particular time period. So we're time stamping the relationships. We're saying this, this relationship is applicable for a particular point in time or a particular period, and this is the cost that applies. And then based on that, we can effectively do some very, very simple uh, shortest weighted path traversals of the graph, and we can calculate the right answer versus the wrong answer. Um, because of the, the overall structure of the graph, I mean, there's, again, route finding, shortest routes, stuff like that. 
very, very well understood in the, the graph literature. There's some very good algorithms for calculating all of that. Um, in our case, we don't actually have to apply many of those algorithms. Instead, we can kind of navigate upwards from the, the point where the parcel comes in, the point where we, we need to deliver it. We kind of navigate our way up the structure until we get to some delivery bases. And only at that point, we bother applying a more sophisticated algorithm. Because the parcel centers and the delivery bases are, are very complexly connected. So we apply Dijkstra at this point in order to calculate the routes between the, the, the stuff at the top. Then we can join it all together very, very quickly and come up with the, the ideal route through the system. Yeah, that's the, that's the last part of the calculation. So um, this isn't the, the, the query that's actually run. This is slightly simpler, just to show you how we can do path-based operations in the graph. So everything we've been looking at so far has really been focused on the, the leaf nodes, you know, the nodes at the end of a pattern. What we're interested in here are the paths, so the nodes and the relationships. And then we want to apply calculations across those paths. So at the, the lowest level of the data model, remember, we're just nodes, relationships, properties, and labels. There's no notion at the level of the data model of a path, but the query language has a very strong notion of what a path constitutes. So here, in this portion of a query, we're effectively generating a path or multiple paths between two locations. So this is where we want to start from. This is where we want to get to. And we're prepared to navigate up to depth four. And this pattern will match all of the different routes that extend from this location to that, where those routes are one, two, three, or four relationships long. And it will assign all of those routes to this path identifier here. So this path identifier will be bound to a collection of paths. And then the return clause, again, is doing some calculation and returning some results. The important part here is the reduce function. So what we're doing here, for each path, we're iterating over the relationships in that particular path. So we've matched four different paths. For each path, we'll go iterate over the relationships, and we'll reduce them. We'll effectively sum all of the, the, the costs of those, those relationships to come up for the, with the, the total weight for that particular path. Yep, it's a simple reduce operation. And then we are returning the, the, the results, the calculations for each path, but we're ordering the results and just taking the top one. So um, I guess with this one, uh, if we're doing it in ascending order, we are, we're picking the cheapest, the shortest path, effectively, or the, the the least costly path based upon this total sum. So effectively, that's the, that's the very simple algorithm at the heart of this. And there's a bit more on top, but that's, I just wanted to communicate how you can work with paths with Neo4j. This is what the overall query looks like. Now, it looks a bit more complex, but actually the equivalent in the relational world, you might be looking at several tens of pages of, of joins and stuff like that. Actually, we just, we've got those three different legs. Get the up leg the down leg and the bit in between at the top, and then do those path calculations across the whole thing, and that's going to give us the optimal route through the system. Okay, so I've got a couple of minutes left to, to, to answer some questions. If you don't already have a copy of the book, go grab it from the, the booth, or if you want a PDF version, you can get one from graphdatabases.com, it's free. And this is a kind of top to bottom view of the world of graph databases, starting with you know, why they're useful, why they're important, how are people using them today? And then chapter by chapter, we, we dig in deeper, looking at the internals, in particular the internals of Neo4j, looking at the query language, and looking at some of those examples in more depth. Um, at that point, I'm pretty much done. Are there any questions? That's right, yeah. So within the, 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 the data model itself, every relationship does have to have a direction. But in the query language, you can ignore the direction. So the general advice is, when you're creating your data set and you're, you're wanting to model bidirectionality, don't worry about the direction, just choose one or the other quite arbitrarily. But then in the query language, as we saw with the initial queries, we just ignore the relationship direction um, and it, it works as, as needed.